You can go ahead and have a seat. I want to welcome you again to Calvary here today. My name is Robert. I'm the family pastor here. And if you're joining us from our McCulloch or Parker campus, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We're just around the corner from our one-year anniversary, and we're grateful to have you guys as a part of the Calvary family as we're now one church with three locations. And for us, man, we're, we're glad that you're here today. And I uh, encourage you to grab a Bible uh, or Bible app, open up to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, with you. We'd love you just grab one of the Bibles in the chair in front of you, or if you're in Parker, there's some at the table in the back. You can get up right now and go grab some of those. But um, me in 2 Timothy 3, page 996 in the Bibles, and you know, we're just around the corner from a new year. It is almost 2020, and uh, we're around the corner from that time. It'll take us three months to reacclimate to writing the date on every document that we fill out and, and going through that journey, but it's a time of new. It's a time of, of new years, new dates. It's also a time of new goals, new resolutions, new initiatives for us. So how many of you would say that you have goals, resolutions, kind of uh, things that you're planning for the upcoming year? You're the type to set goals. Okay, some of you, uh, not a lot of you, but this is a time where a lot of people are, th- are thinking about it. And it's, if nothing else, it's a time where we say, hey, we're going to be a little bit more intentional about the coming year and what we're doing. And I encourage you, if you're not the type to set goals, man, think through some areas of your life. And, and where you want to go in the next year and, and, and think through some goals and, and what that looks like. But as you do that, you know, people all around you and maybe even you guys, you're thinking about goals in a ton of different categories. You've got goals about health and money and fitness and career and time, family, um, hobbies, spiritual growth, all these areas that we can focus on uh, for our goals, for what we want to do in the upcoming year. Maybe you're not the type to say, hey, I'm going to put on the fridge what my goal is but mentally you're like, hey, I want to spend more time doing this thing or I want to focus on this in the upcoming year. And I think that the beginning of a new year can be a great time to do that because I think it can also be a great time to do a little bit of a reset and say, okay, what are those things that are important for us? And we're not just approaching a new year, but also a new decade. Um, and I'm, I'm the young pastor on staff, so I get to say this is my first, first time preaching a new decade sermon uh, as we round the corner in a decade, and some of you are like, oh boy, he's young. Um, and uh, yeah, I am. But you know, as we do that, I wanna challenge you to think about something, not just, hey, where do you wanna be in a year? But I want to challenge you to think a little bit more long-term than that today. And and that is, where do you want to be 10 years from now? What do you want your life to look like 10 years from today? And some of you kind of like cringe at the thought of that challenge because maybe you're the type that is like, I just want to live in the moment. I don't want to think that far out. I can't accurately plan. And that's right. You can't accurately predict. But but follow me anyway. Some of you are like, I don't want to think about that because I've lived through enough decades and I don't want to see another one in 10 years. Um, But still follow me in this. What, What do you want your life to look like in 10 years? Because if, if we think about that and think about, hey, what do we want the outcome to be, it begins to shape right now. If we think about the future and say, hey, here's what I want my life to look like, here's what I want my situation to be, it shapes and influences what we start doing starting now. And, and as we do that, I want to give you guys um, kind of a, a few encouragements from the book of 2 Timothy 3. For the last couple months, uh, I've been able to lead our, our staff meeting devotional every Monday going through the book of, of 2 Timothy. And, and I love this book, and I want to share a passage from it tonight that every time I go through this book stands out to me and just makes an impact on me. But I love 2 Timothy because it's written from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, the really original in the naming of it. Um, and, and it's a, a book that's written as some encouragement and, and instruction to Timothy. But what's so great about it is it comes from Paul towards the end of his life. And, and it's, it's a time where he's kind of reflecting back on his life and his ministry and saying, hey, Timothy, here's some things I learned and some things I want you to know. And there's an incredible amount of clarity and honesty and boldness boldness that comes with Paul as a result of that. So let's take a look. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14, it says this. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, okay, preacher boy, what does that have to do with the new year? Great question. Let's, let's follow in this. So, you know, as you read this, Paul's saying, okay, he's saying, hey, Timothy, pause for a second and remember what you've learned. What's he saying there? Hey, what have you learned in life? And more than that, what have you learned to be important in life? And focus on that, because Paul knows that in the busyness and hectic nature of life, it can be easy to lose what's really important. It can be easy to caught up in all the details, all the busyness, all the little stuff, and lose the big picture. And he's saying, hey, focus on the big picture. He's also telling Timothy, hey, remember that, that Christ is supreme in all things, and even if it's difficult, even if you grow weary of doing the right thing, continue in it. And so knowing that, knowing kind of Paul's challenge to Timothy here, I've got uh, a couple things that I want to encourage you guys. As we start a new year together and launch into that, I've got a couple uh, things for us. And the first is that as you look forward to next year, uh, my challenge is to make following Jesus better your goal for 2020. Now, if you've got a business management uh, background and you're familiar with like smart goals and how to write proper goals, you know that that is not a properly worded goal. Um, and stick with me in that. There's a few of you chuckling because you know what I mean. You're like, that's not measurable. Better is not a measurement. It's not, but stick with me. Because see, the truth is if you're a follower of Jesus, which means you believe that Jesus is the son of God and savior of the world, you believe that he lived a perfect and sinless life. You believe that he went and died on a cross to pay for your sins and rose three days later, and you've made a commitment commitment to follow him with your life, then that means that Christ should be the most important thing in your life. And above any other goal of, about our careers or family or time management or hobbies or finances, making Christ more uh, greatly exalted in your life should be your goal. And so as we launch into a new year, I want to challenge you to think about what does it look like for you in your situation, in your areas, in your life, what does it look like for you to follow Jesus better starting in 2020? And, and to help us think through some of that, I want to give you uh, kind of three different areas to think through as we, as we unpack that. But know as well that um, as we unpack this, know that the perfection is never going to be the destination. As, as we live as followers of Jesus, Everything that we do in terms of following him better is progress, and that's what God desires from us. He desires progress, not perfection. And, and some of you are, are wired in a way that if you can't reach perfection in an area, it's discouraging and, and frustrating, but understand that, that that is your life here on earth of following Jesus. You're always going to fall short of perfection, which is exactly why we need Jesus. If we could do everything perfectly, we wouldn't need Jesus, but that's not the case. Because Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of God's standards and his glory. But the good news is found all throughout the, the gospel uh, that Jesus came to save us. That is, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that, that Christ took our sins so that we could take his righteousness and perfection. And so understand that as we work towards this, there's never going to be a point where we're like, hey, I've arrived, I'm perfect as a follower of Christ, which means no matter where you're at on the spectrum, if this is your second week following Jesus or your 70th year following Jesus, there's steps that you need to take to follow him better and to, to, to grow in your obedience to God. And so knowing that, I want to unpack kind of three different areas of our life of what it looks like to follow Jesus better this year. Um, and so the first of those three areas is in your personal life. And what I mean by that is, is the, the, the private areas of your life where it's just you and God. It doesn't have anything to do with your outward actions, your outward religious displays, anything like that. It's just simply you and God. How well are you following Jesus in those places? How well are you uh, growing and progressing in your faith in the private areas where it's just you and God? And so some questions in that, you know, how is your prayer life? Are you actively and regularly having conversation with God? Are you regularly confessing and repenting of sin and growing through that? Are you, are you trusting in God? Are you working on your own plans and initiatives? Are you, are you regularly reading and applying scripture to your life? Because see, these are all things that no one else can see. This is just you. 
And, and this is where we have to start. If we say, hey, I want my faith to be more, more uh, vibrant, more active, more healthy, then this is a place that it starts because we can't work on the outward actions if we're not working on our heart and our relationship with Him. And what we have to understand is if we want God to bless in our life and work through us, then that begins with us being faithful in the margins and the private spaces of our life. And so how are you doing at following Jesus when no one else is watching, when no one else is aware of your thoughts, your, your, your motives, your, your ideas? How are you following Jesus in those places? So, so my challenge is, is to start there and say, hey, how is my one-on-one relationship with Christ? How well am I connecting with Him, growing closer to Him, spending time with Him, and let that be the place that you, you launch from? So how are you doing it, just you and God, as in your, your private, your personal life? Second area to, to think about is in your family life. If you want to, to grow in your faith and have a, a faith that's healthier and is more vibrant, how are you doing it, displaying and living out your faith at home? Because, see, I'm convinced and convicted of the fact that if we care about the faith uh, nature of our family, whether that's our kids, our spouse, or just the people that are around us, a huge contributor to how vibrant and healthy their faith is is how well we display consistent faith and godly character. And, and so our family is watching how we live out our faith. Our family is watching how we are, are following Jesus now, it doesn't mean that if we mess up once, they're, they're you know, SOL and they're not going to ever follow God because we messed up once, but it means that they're watching. They're watching if we're the same person during the week as we are when we walk through the doors of this church on the weekend. And if you're involved at Calvary, either serving and volunteering or leading, that's even more true for you. They're watching. They're watching those things. They're watching if you offer the grace and forgiveness that you claim to have received. They're, they're watching if you live with, with integrity and honesty. They're watching how you treat people and how you respond to difficulties. See, the, the family aspect can't be skipped. We can't think that, that we just display our faith and live it out here at the church and out in the community and when we're at that event we're volunteering at and think that that is going to lead to God working in our life and blessing us. Because before we have an opportunity to have a mission field and have people that we can influence, we have to be doing that at home. So how are you doing at living out your faith at home? And I, and I love how Paul starts this because he, 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 he alludes to this because he's like, remember what you've learned and firmly believed. He said, and from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. He's saying, hey, Timothy, remember all the stuff that you've known since you were a child. Where does he get that? From, from his family. He even alludes to, he says, and remember from whom you've learned this. Now, we don't really catch this in the, the three verses that we're looking at tonight uh, of the significance of that statement, but when you go back to the, the first chapters, Paul's opening up the book of 2 Timothy. He's greeting and kind of getting his, his introductions out of the way, and he asked Timothy to greet these two women, Lois and Eunice, who are Timothy's mother and grandmother. And as he's doing that, he's saying that how he's noticed their vibrant and influential faith and how he's seen that faith pass from generation to generation and now impact Timothy. He's saying, hey, your family is your first mission field, your first place of influence. He's saying the, the family aspect carries great significance. See, parents, grandparents, don't underestimate the ability to impact your family. Don't underestimate or undervalue that influence because you have a chance to impact a, a huge, huge part of our world through just influencing your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, nephews. So how are you doing at living out your faith at home? Your family is watching how you live it out. So let's take advantage of that and give them a proper display of faith, a proper showing of what it looks like to follow Jesus. So we've got our personal life, we've got our family life, and next, how well are you following Jesus in the marketplace? 
And by, and by that, I mean not just, you know, the actual market, the supermarket, but in the, the community with friends at, at work, online, uh, with, you know, hanging out at, at clubs and hobbies and those places of social interaction. How are you representing Jesus in those places? Because, see, it, it's this circle of, of influence that spreads outward that, that we have to think about as followers of Christ. And so let's think about a couple of those marketplace interactions. The first is with our friends. Because, see, our family sees who we really are, good, bad, and ugly, and and our friends see a good portion of that as well. They really know how we respond to stuff, where our heart is, how our character is, because they see a lot of our life. And so my, my question for you is, you know, what do your friends think about Christianity as a result of being friends with you? And how well are you living out your faith in front of your friends? And, and, and with that, all of your friends, because I think we all have those like circles and different groups of friends that we hang out with. And some of them are like our church friends, and we're like super honest and talking about prayer requests. And some of those are, we'll just call them the not church friends. And we maybe use a little different terminology and a little different uh, phrasing of what we do on the weekends and stuff. But see, how well are you representing Jesus across all of those friend groups. Because I think that, that with our friends, we have huge opportunities to, to share the good news, to influence them to a relationship with Christ. Just like our families, they're watching us and watching how we live out our faith. They're paying attention to how we speak, how we make decisions, how we spend our time and our money. They're paying attention to how we treat people and how we respond to situations. So think about this. In your, your friend groups with your specific friends, do they have a, a higher view of Christ or a lower view of Christ because of your friendship with them? Are they more or less likely to be interested in a growing relationship with Jesus because of your friendship? See, we should all be in a place where we're acting as salt and light in those places and encouraging others so much that they are are curious and desiring of a relationship with Christ because of what they see in us. So with your friends, how well are you representing Jesus? Secondly, think about your life at work if you're actively working. I know some of you are are kind of transitioned out of full-time work. I know some of you are right in the middle of it, and we got the full spectrum but, but how well are you representing Jesus and living out your faith at work? And, and with that, you know, are you working with character and integrity? Are you working with honesty and, and providing values that represent Jesus well? Do you care about your coworkers and want to invest in their life? And better, if you've got employees, if you, you know, own a business or you're a manager of a business, do you care about those who work for you? And I'm, I'm going to get a little bit even more personal here because I think you'd talk to, you know, 10 business owners out of 10 would say, yes, I care about my employees. But a little bit more honest question is, do you care more about how you can contribute to their life or about how they can contribute to your bottom line? So do you truly care about people the way Jesus does of saying, hey, I want to invest, I want to serve, I want to make a difference in your life? And I think that, that a, a challenge we have as followers of Christ is to think that, that work is kind of isolated from the, the rest of our life. That work is kind of this place of gray, this, this place void of significance and meaning that, you know, we've got our life and everything that's important here, and then we've got, like, work, and we just go, and that's, you know, we punch the clock, we do our thing, and we go home. But really, when we look at it, we spend a huge chunk of our life at work. 30% roughly of the average American's life is spent at work. And you think, oh, that still leaves us 70%. That's a small percentage. Well, you also have to factor in sleep, which is another roughly 30%. If you're a mother of young children, it's more like 10% of your life. But, you know, when you look at your waking hours depending on how much you work and how much you sleep, somewhere between 47 and 48% of your life is spent at work. Which means that for a lot of people, they spend more time with their coworkers than they do their spouse and their children. See, the, the workplace isn't this place of just nothingness, of void, but it's a place where we have a huge amount of opportunity to influence the kingdom of God, to make a difference in this world if we're living out our faith there. 
So how well are you living out your faith to your coworkers, to your bosses, to your employees, and how well are you making a difference there? Finally, as we think about just all these marketplace interactions that we have, think about your online interactions. See, all of us today have some level of online interaction, whether that's through social media, of, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, all those platforms and what we're posting and interacting with there, whether it's just through text messaging and email and just interacting that way, or even you go old school and you've got like discussion forums and threads and stuff like that, that you're, you're conversing with. How are you interacting? What are you representing? What are you displaying to the world through your online interactions? Because I think we often take on a little different persona when we get behind a keyboard or a screen, and it gets very different. See, if you're a follower of Christ, that identity of Jesus' follower should change our decisions and our actions in every area of our life. Yet what I often see is is Christians thinking that they kind of get a pass on that when it comes to their online activity. And what I've seen, especially in the last few months, is that the things they post or view or say and do online, it does not represent Christ well. And oftentimes, I've seen people that are, that are very serious about their faith conduct themselves online in a way that's either um, distracting or even detrimental to the mission of Christ. See, we can't just think that this is a place where we can do whatever we want and it's separate from our life. We have to represent Jesus and live with his character and integrity online just like we do in person. And so what that means for us is that that if you have political opinions, that's great. Are those thoughts more important than representing Jesus? You've got opinions on news and current events, that's great. Is it more important than representing Jesus? You've got opinions and preferences on products and how a business treated you and how things around town are happening, that's great. Is it more important than following and representing Jesus? Because, see, we need to be the people that are are speaking and acting with love, with grace, with character and integrity. And often I see Christians operating online with less love, less grace, less compassion towards others than their unbelieving friends. See, even those that have different opinions with you need to be treated with the truth from Ephesians 4.29 that says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. See, all these areas of our life how we respond, how we represent Jesus matters. And whether it's in your personal life, your family, your marketplace interaction, do a, do a checkup here as we end 2019. How are you doing at living for Jesus? And if you want a little bit better examination of that, go to Galatians chapter 5 and read the fruit of the Spirit and take each of those characteristics and say, how well am I living that out? How well am I representing Jesus in these areas? Because if we want to to follow Jesus better in 2020, we have to first say, hey, where do I need to grow? Where do I need to start in that? But also as we do that, we have to remember that Scripture is our greatest guide. See, as as Paul is, is talking to Timothy, he's saying, hey, as you continue in these things, also remember Scripture. He says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, we need to remember that the Bible is the guide that we have. It is the instruction manual for life. It is the guide that we have to navigate every single one of life's situations. And, and we... we need to also remember that this is the literal Word of God. It's not just another book. It's not just another document from ages long past, but it's the literal Word of God, and that's what Paul is reminding Timothy of here. And and why does that matter? Well, there's three reasons why that matters. First, it it matters because that means Scripture is important, and and we should come to it and and approach it from a place of significance, saying, hey, this actually matters. This is actually going to make a difference in my life. And secondly, we uh, need to remember that because it's the Word of God, it's trustworthy. 
It's never going to lead us astray. It's never going to give us bad advice. It's never going to tell us to jump off a bridge or do something crazy in our life. It's always going to give us advice that takes us to a place of God's blessing in our life. And, and, and also remember that, that it's trustworthy in every single one of the details. We believe that because it's the Word of God that it contains no error, no fault, no problem. And this could be a whole sermon on its own, but the short of it is that the Bible is trustworthy in every single aspect and is just as trustworthy today as it was the day it was written. And so, because it's the Word of God, it it matters in our life, it's trustworthy, and it's also transformative. The Bible can work and transform your life in a way no other document or book or instruction manual or self-help document can. So what's the secret there? Well, the secret is we have to read it. We have to interact with it. We have to actually be consuming Scripture and and having it come into our life where we're studying and applying it. And, And the same way that a gym membership is only useful when we use it, Scripture is only transformative when we're reading and knowing and applying it. And a a study that I read uh, this week as I was getting ready for this showed that for the average church-going American, about 40% of them read the Bible less than two times a month. And I'm not going to ask you guys to do a, a poll with that right now, but think about that. 40% of, of church-goers only pick up the Bible once or twice a month. Now, that's better than, than nothing, but think about from a fitness perspective, going to the gym once or twice a month isn't going to make a very big impact on your life and your health. And Scripture is the same way. And so about a year ago, Chad gave you guys a challenge saying, hey, for 2019, let's read through the New Testament together. And he laid out, hey, about a chapter a day, we'll get you through the New Testament and we'll kind of walk you through the entirety of the Gospels and Jesus' life, but also the teachings and instructions like Second Timothy here. Um, and so how many of you, I, I am asking for a poll here, how many of you completed the, the New Testament in a year thing? Cool. Quite a few of you guys. For those of you that didn't, you know, I know a lot of you are like, I didn't know about that. I missed that week. Hey, that's fine. Um, Because we're actually going to start it again. Starting next weekend, we're going to encourage you guys to to jump in. It'll be in the bulletin with the weekly readings. Um, But really, it's a chapter a day. So if you've got five, maybe seven minutes a day, you can read the entire New Testament in a year. Um, And so you can use the, the reading plan that we'll have in the bulletin starting next weekend, or uh, what I did is I've got a Bible app on my phone and find a reading plan there. The one I use, it actually gives you a chapter a day, Monday through Friday, and then the weekends are some, some smaller verses and some things to think on, and also a chance for you to catch up if you fell behind. So, and it worked out to, to literally exactly your reading Monday through Friday, one chapter, and then having some time to catch up. But if you want to, to follow Christ better this year, if you want to see God work in your life and transform you, then, then reading the Bible has to be a big portion of your life. And so my challenge for you is we approach 2020, let's make that a year where we're consuming the Bible more regularly, where we're getting to know God's Word, where we're really getting to know who He is, what His thoughts are, what He wants us to be doing and living and believing in. And as we do that, it's going to help us to follow Jesus better in our personal life with our families and in the marketplace. So, th- so as we end 2019 and, and approach 2020, the new year, the new decade, the new phase here, what is, what is that year, what is this upcoming decade going to be defined as for you? And, and my hope for you tonight and, and as we approach a new year is that, that this would be a year and a decade that's defined as you growing and progressing as a follower of Christ? Have you saying uh, that your faith is more vibrant in your personal life, that your faith is more vibrant with your family, in the marketplace, with your friends, and work? Because as we end this year, and, and whenever we end 2020 and progress further, we want God to look at our progress and our life and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the way that we do that is by making Scripture a priority, and by following Jesus more diligently with each passing year. That's our hope and our prayer for you as you start a new year. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for today. We just thank you for an opportunity to 
just spend some time thinking about following you better. God, we know that, that all of us have room to grow and develop, whether we've been following Jesus for a few weeks or a few decades. God, we know that, that we have a chance to grow. And, and we just ask that you help us in that. Help us to see the areas of our life that, that we haven't completely given over to you, that we haven't truth, truly and completely obeyed and, and, and followed you in so that we can change and grow in the upcoming year. God, we know it's not our own power that makes this possible. It's you working through us. So we just ask that you show up in a, in a mighty way. Show up and work in our life in a, a way that we can see and celebrate to encourage us to continue in it. Thank you for the, the, your word that teaches us what to believe and how to live and how to grow as followers of Christ. We just ask that you help us. Help us to, to be genuine in our faith. Help us to, to genuinely live it out for our family, our friends, at work, online, and all the places that we live. Because we want to, to help the mission of Christ grow forward. We don't want to hinder it in any way. So help us to do that tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.